Seems like the package has arrived. Let's see what's in it. Whoa! Surprise, bosses! While they can blindside you, oftentimes it's not completely out of nowhere. Sometimes there could be actual buildup, but it's so subtle that you miss it and it still throws you off. This can be really hard to pull off well without the boss coming off as a cop-out. Or sometimes you have a great surprise, but the boss itself is hot garbage. So for this list, we're looking for the biggest surprises, but how it affects the story as well as the fight has to be good. And they earn extra points if there is buildup, but it's only obvious upon a second playthrough. Before we get into the video, I have a weird question. If you directly contribute to the project, does it count as a sponsorship? I mean, I got paid for saying this, so, um, eh, whatever. This video is sponsored by the Waifu Handbook Kickstarter. Yes, this really exists. And yes, yours truly helped. This is a Valentine's Day pose that spiraled out of control because the lead designer, Stuart, you know, the funny looking guy who makes the alignment videos, he has a real problem saying no, and he just kept adding stuff. He asked for my help in adding and converting a lot of his pet project's weird ideas to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Yes, this behemoth of weeaboo cringe is compatible with D&D 5e as well as Pathfinder 1st and 2nd Editions. God be praised. If you want to spice up your D&D game with waifu-inspired classes, NPCs, ancestries, plus an easily understandable cooking system, and teamwork mechanics, no, I'm not putting air quotes around teamwork, get your heads out of the gutter, the book is not lewd, then this is the book for you. I do get 10% of the Kickstarter proceeds, so supporting this project does support the channel. If you head to getwaifu.loadingcrewcrafts.com by clicking the link in the description and the pinned comment, this will take you to our VIP page. By submitting a $1 deposit, you are guaranteeing yourself the best spot, granting you 10% off on a soft cover book. Plus, if we reach $20,000 in funding, the soft cover will be upgraded to hardcover absolutely free. As an additional thank you, we have a special VIP system set up for people who want the best deal. As of this recording, we already have over 150 VIPs signed up. Since you guys are being so amazing and supportive right now, we're expanding this VIP offer to 300. If we reach that, well, who knows? So go ahead and click on, and remember, if you want to get on the best deal of the Kickstarter, click on the getwaifu.ludencrewcrafts.com link in the description for 10% off the cost of the Kickstarter, and of course, your free hardcover upgrade. Remember, supporting this project also supports my channel. Thank you all so much for listening, and back to your regularly scheduled content. Get your boss bingo cards ready. You see my swag, now you wanna come and give me all this drag. I think you better back back, because my hand is itching to give you a smack. Sometimes I wonder what goes on in the minds of Mega Man devs. I know the story is never a big deal in these games, but why do they keep trying to make Wily a twist villain so many times? They even point out how obnoxious and repetitive it is in 9, and yet they still keep oh on God, doing it. It's even worse in the X games, since these are supposed to have grittier and more serious narratives. But but lo and behold, Sigma has to keep coming back and upstaging the villain of the game. And again, they keep acting like it's a surprise. For once, just once, can we have a final boss in these two series that isn't Wily or Sigma? Oh look, exactly what I asked for. 17 games later. Oh, who am I kidding? It was all worth it. Sunstar is the final boss of Mega Man 5. The Game Boy one, that is. He is the doomsday weapon awakened by Wily in one of his many world domination plans. When Wily orders him to kill Mega Man, he gets chased away instead. Sunstar then demands a fair duel with the Blue Bomber. Going toe to toe with another robot master to cap off the game is pretty refreshing. Helps that his arsenal is twice as dangerous as your own, between his great bulk and giant lasers. He even uses Hold man's weapon in a way that's legitimately threatening. Sure, the Game Boy limitations hold him back a bit from being as flashy as he could be, but fans did give him an even cooler fight in the 8-bit deathmatch, if that's your fancy. As for Lumine, he masterminded the Jacob Project, one where the ultimate goal is to usher in a new age for next generation Reploids. Oh, and he also puppeteered Sigma throughout the game. Given how often Sigma toyed with the other villains from the shadows, it's about dang time Karma caught up to him. 
and Luminous fight is spectacular, using the overdrive version of the Maverick attacks in his arsenal. All the while, a gorgeous orchestra and church organ plays throughout the fight, actuating his Rigo presence. It gets even more epic in the second phase where he goes after you in a full-blown bullet hell angel form. Now, admittedly, if these two bosses were in any other game, we would have seen them coming a mile away. But in Mega Man? The fact that it wasn't Wily or Sigma is half the surprise. These two have been trolling us for so long, they've practically held the series hostage. The idea is even if someone else is the final boss, they still expect it to be us. I know this seems like small potatoes, but for Mega Man fans, having these two here is like the miracle of escaping Shawshank. Helps that these villains themselves are actually pretty cool and have good fights. Look at it this way. It could have been so much worse. You see my swag, now you wanna come and give me all this drag. I think you better back back because my hand is itching to give you a smack. Punch Out is one of those games that's simple, but effective. And the Wii Make had much more depth than it really needed, with fun characters as well as some interesting challenges. After getting through the grueling title defense mode, you unlock one final quest. Max Last Stand. If you lose three times, Mac retires, and you can never play career mode again. So, <laughs> no pressure or anything. Oh yeah, and you uh, can't quit or restart either. Okay, there's pressure. When you play Max Last Stand, you have a chance of coming face to face with none other than Donkey Kong himself. Oh. I don't know how it's legal to have a monkey fight, but hey, they let this guy bring in a storm drain lid as armor, so yeah, whatever, guess anything goes. Oh, fun fact, did you know that on average, a gorilla is 20 times stronger than a human? Checks out here, DK hits like a truck. Must be because Mac is short. So do we outspeed him? Ha <laughs> ha, nope. DK's also surprisingly fast. He's also one of the only opponents capable of actually dodging you. The fact that you have a chance of never fighting him again really adds to the tension. The only real reason that Donkey Kong isn't any higher is that he's secretly been there the whole time. If you have a keen eye, you can actually spot him in the crowds. That goes all the way back to the original arcade game. You see my swag, now you wanna come and give me all this drag. I think you better back back because my hand is itching to give you a smack. Ugh, I make it no secret how much I hate. <laughs> was not particularly pleased with Titan and what it represents. However, if any good came out of that boneheaded boss fight, that's the aftermath. Joker's little stunt poisoned him and now he's slowly dying. He blackmails Bats into helping him find a cure, and yet, halfway through, it looks like Joker's already back on his feet. Okay, so he took the cure and is ready to let the Bat die. Straightforward answer, right? Incorrect. Actually, look a little closer and things don't quite add up. Interesting conversations you overhear, little hints in plain sight you can see through detective vision. Heck, even Joker himself gives you some clues that things aren't what they seem. Ring, ring! So how do you keep a secret from the world's greatest detective? Well, do you know? You stick it right in front of him, right under his long pointy nose. And wait! And then wham! In the finale, it's all out in the open. Joker is still dying, and the cured Clown Prince of Crime was actually Clayface in disguise messing with you, ready for one last brawl to the death. As a combatant, Clayface is tough, but it's not exactly a brain teaser. Dodge as many of his blows as you can, freeze blast him enough times, beat his little mini clay goons, and boom, done. Coolest part, you fight the goons off with a sword. After all that, you're free to cure yourself and... Enjoy a bittersweet end to the Clown Prince of Crime. Honestly, the only real reason this fight is this low is that while the buildup and payoff for the fake Joker gag are really well handled, not so much for Clayface himself. The only other time he's featured in the Arkham series is in an Easter egg in the first game, and now he pops up for the very last fight of the game, and he feels more like a prop than a character. One with lumbar support, perhaps. Because, well, look, the final boss of a Batman game is Clayface. Sit on me. But hey, beggars can't be choosers. Mystery is still nicely done when you know what clues to look for. You see my swag, now you wanna come and give me all this drag. I think you better back back because my hand is itching to give you a smack. Final Fantasy IV was one of those weird in-between games in the series. On the one hand, we had a more serious plot with real character development. On the other hand, we still had our Crystal MacGuffins and enough fake-out deaths to make a drinking game out of. 
At one point, the party sneaks back into Baron so they can find Sid. Bagan, captain of the knights, joins your party along the way. But before you can even open the menu to check out his stats and abilities, it turns out to be evil. Pretty sure that just set a record for the fastest a character's ever been betrayed in a work of fiction. I used to intend Seymour joined you for a battle. As a boss, Bagan is fairly difficult. He has a reflect counter, can inflict ailments on the party, can speed himself up. That plus his arms will be draining your HP. As for how to deal with him, yeah, two ways, though neither of them are completely foolproof. He can go all in with the twin cast, but that requires both Palum and Porum to be alive. Good luck doing that. You could try to have Yong go for kicks, but that takes a lot longer. Mm, decisions, decisions. Afterwards, the party just moves on after a single exchange. So was Bygone Evil all along, or was some other guy impersonating him? It said that Golbez gave him great power, and we saw a report to Cognazzo about Cecil acting out of line. Did Bacon turn evil? Unlike the king, where you can find the real version of him, Bacon is just kind of forgotten. It's still a mystery. Those guys are dorks. You see my swag, now you wanna come and give me all this drag. I think you better back back, because my hand is itching to give you a smack. Figured it was time for another Pokemon boss. I know you guys have your Josh Scorcher boss bingo card with Jubileus as the free space, so you can mark another one off. Probably the most unsurprising entry on this list by far. Come on, this is a series where trainers spot you from the most random locations just to force you into battle with their top Rattata. It's the best of all the Rattatas. So for this list, we need something that is so surprising that it doesn't surprise you from them seeing you. It's from you seeing them. Stop me if the nostalgia becomes too much. You are a fresh-faced trainer playing through Gen 2 or the remakes for the first time. You travel through Johto, crushing every trainer in your path. You're amazed that Kanto is also playable. You demolish it as well. Professor Oak tells you about the mysterious Mount Silver and its strong Pokemon. You journey up the mountain, fending back powerful Pokemon that come at you. And at its peak, you spy the last trainer you expect. The player character from the previous games Red stands there, and as you approach the battle to decide who the best there ever was, begins. Red comes at you with a powerful team made up of the Kanto starters, Snorlax, Espeon, or Lapras, depending on if it's the remix or not, and his trusty Pikachu. Each of these Pokemon has the power and tenacity to beat you if you didn't come in expecting these threats. Blastoise, Snorlax, Lapras, and Venusaur are tanky and will wear you down with either power or status effects. Espeon, Pikachu, and Charizard on the other hand will try to end you quickly being the glass cannons they are. This fight is even harder in the remake. Pikachu actually becomes somewhat threatening, Lapras shows up to make it more balanced, and all the levels are even higher. Oh. The shock of seeing your player character out of nowhere, especially after traversing the region they did and conquering it, really brings a feeling like no other. While other trainers have surpassed Red in levels since then, he is still considered the strongest trainer, lore-wise. This fight will push you to your limits, but if you win, you don't just conquer Red, you conquer who you were in the past generation. You truly become the best there ever really was and ever will be. Now, I wonder how many people will be mad I didn't mention the surprise in Undella Town. Eh, whatever. You see my swag, now you wanna come and give me all this drag. I think you better back back, because my hand is itching to give you a smack. If I had a nickel for every time a fiery butterfly hijacked a boss fight, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? For context, let's take a look back at Kirby's Star Ally, shall we? It's near the end of the guest star Star Allies Go subgame. Looks like you won and kill the credits. Those are pretty fast for end credits and... Wait, what the heck? Galacta Knight? Oh, that threw me off. Good one, game. Let's see about... Ooh. What's that butterfly doing? <laughs> did, did that butterfly just f***ing disintegrate Galacta Knight? Oh, it's not just any butterfly. No, it's Morpho Knight. He yanks away the original boss fight and takes over the brawl, ready to slice into us with his flaming sword. But hey, once we take him out, we're done with his shenanigans. <laughs> oh, who am I kidding? You all know the answer. He pulls the exact same trick a second time in Forgotten Land, and we just don't see it coming. Post game, we finally reawaken King Leongar, but then he gets possessed by Sol Forgo, and we have to fight him for a short bit. After beating his highness, Sol Forgo emerges, and it looks like it's his turn to play. Guess what happens? 
Yep, good old Morpho sniped another battle. And now more than ever, he's bringing the heat. I cited him as one of my favorite fire bosses, and I meant it. His erratic movements, his aesthetics, and now the fact that he's killed two would-be fighters just to get a chance to smite us. Obviously, the Star Allies fight was already gonna be a surprise, well, with Galacta barging in, but then Morpho took that surprise and turned it on its head. Meanwhile, Forgotten Lance was hinted at with Leongar's involvement, but seeing Morpho take that away from him was unexpected. The biggest surprise of all, however, those butterflies. These little buggers have followed Kirby as far back as Return to Dreamland in 2011. So, all along, they've had the power to steal the souls of anyone they land on and use said souls to create Morpho Knights. And they've used this power to jock block other fighters so he can have his own moment in the spotlight? Okay, yeah, I can respect that. This managed to do it twice. You see my swag, now you wanna come and give me all this drag. I think you better back back because my hand is itching to give you a smack. Hey kids, do you like controversial opinions? Eh, uh, you've had a lot of hot takes at this point, I've gotten used to it. Good, we're gonna talk about Ridley from Samus Returns. No, you listen here, Roberto! Yeah, my stance hasn't changed. This is one of the greatest fights in Metroid. The challenge, the cinematic value, the way he just swoops in as a surprise bookend. It's just so good. So imagine my surprise when I actually got backlash to putting it as one of the best final bosses in gaming. How? Well, I believe a few factors play into it. Ridley is considered the signature recurring nemesis in the series, similar to Bowser and Ganon. Is it just fan service? Yes. But hey, I'm a fan, and I like being serviced! Ridley's fights have always had strong variations between each other, and this is no exception. Besides, it didn't retcon anything. Ridley's alive in Super Metro anyway, so it can easily make the argument that he was knocked unconscious, or maybe he died, but the Space Pirates recovered his body and revived him. Plus, the baby Metroid is considerably vital to the overall story of the series. I'd say getting to see it be more involved in a fight adds to its presence in the narrative. Also, you know, seeing Samus and the baby risk their lives for each other is some really great non-verbal storytelling to develop the two's relationship and, you know, helps us get attached to the well guy a bit more too. If it's any compensation, Ridley is nowhere to be found in dread, so I guess he can be as much of a surprise in absence as he is when present. You see my swag, now you wanna come and give me all this drag. I think you better back back, because my hand is itching to give you a smack. In Fultland's dawning era, there was a man acclaimed for slaying the goddess of Nabatea. They call him Nemesis, the King of Liberation. Bearing the crest of flames, he's able to wield the sword of the creator, forged from the remnants of the goddess he killed. With it, he massacred any and all life descended from her. All except five, one of which is Seros, who challenged Nemesis and killed him. In his, in his legacy, legacy their Garthans, Garthans take upon themselves to abuse the blood of the goddess's children, children all to obtain the power of crests, which, which they plan to weaponize against Seros. But alas, they, they fall, fall to the arrows of Claude and the, and the Lester Alliance. Alliance. What, what remains of the King of Liberation's will is ultimately erased. Or so we think. <laughs> So, out of seemingly nowhere, it's not in any of the other routes, it's revealed that the Agarthans have been plotting to resurrect Nemesis. Does this add even more to how vague and poorly addressed they are? Perhaps. But hey, still got an awesome fight out of it. Nemesis marches into battle with the 10 elites by his side. Powered by a shield, sees a poison, and beast galore, his army flattens all that stands in his way. Like a good Fire Emblem boss, the fight encourages you to assess the situation and remove necessary targets to neutralize harmful terrain and reinforcements, since Nemesis himself gains protection and buffs from the swamp around him. That's one man Shrek ain't chasing out anytime soon. On top of that, there's just so much unique atmosphere to behold here. You're not fighting a dragon or a godlike being, you're fighting the man who killed a god. Someone on par with the average Fire Emblem protag. Okay, I mean, yeah, Nemesis technically killed Sothis in her sleep, but still, getting that far ain't child's play. And finally, God Shattering Star speaks for itself. Pretty 
arrived at the spike being a mere puppet hero to the Agarthans, Nemesis single-handedly carried them through Golden Deer's finale. He doesn't need complex plans or noble goals. All he wanted was a liberation. He will kill and destroy as much as he has to for it. Nemesis has such a strong presence as a final boss that even Engage had him represent the villain emblem for Three Houses. A moment of silence for Crimson Flower fans. You see my swag, now you wanna come and give me all this drag. I think you better back back because my hand is itching to give you a smack. Partners in Time doesn't have writing as complex as something like Super Paper Mario, but it makes up for that big time with its visual storytelling. Just look at some of the things the Shroobs did. Invasion, assault, abduction, harvest, mutation, these things be morbid. But hey, as long as we get the Cobalt Star back, we can surely defeat their princess, right? Well, yeah, that's what we're told. But then we get these strange hints that our adventure may not be so straightforward. From baby Luigi crying at the Cobalt Star Spirit to Tobert showing us the truth behind his sketch, something bigger is at play here. Even after we defeated Princess Shrew, Peach warned us not to put the star back together because, as it turns out, she used it to imprison this thing, Princess Shrew's elder sister. Ursula's crazy sister. Yeah, it's that plot twist, but this time it's actually good. As I said, most of this game's storytelling is visual. We don't see anyone directly imply anything about another Princess Shroop or that the Cobalt Star can be used to imprison someone. We had to keenly catch on to the hints about the Elder Princess's existence. And when she does appear, the realization that we've been fooled by the true villain into releasing her comes smacking us in the face. Literally, she lives up to the surprise big time with a legendary fight. Elder Princess Shroom not only has a ton of tricky attacks, but she can use multiples of them in a row as the battle goes on. And if that's not enough, the second phase is even more hectic with the princess going eldritch sized and launching one kamikaze attack after another. If you get tired at any point in this fight, you know you're underprepared. I've gone on and on about how great this fight is and the daunting implications surrounding it. It's a really good fight that's difficult, dramatic, and does the visual brutality of the shroobs justice. Even if it's technically not the final boss, still salty about how bad Schrauser is, that in no way detracts from what an unforgettable surprise climax this is. Doctor Let's Shake, No More Heroes 2, the boss we didn't get to fight in the first game returns with a magnitude of 10. Fake Pepino, Pizza Tower, the hidden fourth boss is your doppelganger, your malformed, abominable doppelganger. King Cerberus, Devil May Cry 5, he was the first major demon Dante fought, and now he's making a bookend return for one last surprise tussle. Monsoon, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, expecting your average assassin, here's a lesson in meme culture instead. Photoshop Flowey, Undertale. With how often this Photoshop madness shows up on these lists, you'd already see this one coming. So, Ace Attorney, I figure for a list like this, I should surprise you with the last entry, eh? Yes, it has bosses. I mean, what do you call cross-examining the witnesses or culprits? They are enemies you have to press buttons to ward off. A lot of the witnesses in Ace Attorney are some of the craziest and dastardly -est people you would ever meet. Whether it's the two-faced Dahlia Hawthorne, the suave Shelley DeKiller, or the insanity that is Wendy Oldbag, there are plenty of choices that could be made for this list. But none of these are surprising, or at least surprising enough to be number one. This isn't helped by the fact that almost every Ace Attorney villain is freaking obvious, mostly from their outfits alone, or the fact that the case intros spell it out for you. No, we need crazy, we need kooky, we need evil like you've never seen. We need a villain so out of left field and so intimidating that it devastates the entire world of Ace Attorney for seven long years. We need... No, not him. Here's the context. In Dual Destinies, the final case puts you trying to solve the mystery of two space station bombings and who killed Athena's mother, and trying to make sure Athena herself doesn't go down for the crimes. 
Throughout the case, you hear hints of a spy who caused the sabotage. This phantom of seven years was one that Prosecutor Blackwell was searching for in order to avenge his mentor. He shows almost no emotion, only fearing his identity being exposed, killing anyone in order to protect it. He is the shadow behind Prosecutor Blackwell's false conviction, the death of Athena's mother and Apollo's best friend, and the last looming specter propagating the dark age of the law. And this dastardly foe turns out to be... Yeah, the goofball detective that you meet throughout the game whose antics make Gumshoe look like Sherlock Holmes in comparison. Just not this franchise's version of Sherlock, he's his own can of worms. Anyways, finding out Fulbright was the Phantom really came out of left field as he was a pretty beloved character up to this point. Before the trial, we had a really vulnerable and heartfelt moment that showed he was going through a crisis of belief and seemed to really care for Blackwell. When you confront him in the final trial section, he still plays the part of Fulbright to a T. Though, as you break through his lies, he starts to show his true self, or he becomes stone-faced and is able to completely control his emotions. When Edgeworth finally shows up to reveal Fulbright has been dead this whole time, we finally get to see his true face. But he is a faceless entity, one who goes from name to name to complete the missions before him. He switches masks to throw off Team Wright, eventually donning the Turnabout Terror's face himself in one final power move. However, by finding a way to reveal the Phantom's identity and forcing him to face his fear, the Phantom goes through an existential crisis that leads to his downfall. The fact that Fulbright was the Phantom really threw me for a loop when I first played Dual Destinies. I really liked this character, thinking he was the new detective to replace Gumshoe and Emma. And he's been helpful to you and even gave you evidence you needed to win a trial. That led Athena to get accused of murder. Oh, but the fact that the real Fulbright died meant we could have actually had a Fulbright in our midst that wasn't evil. Darn you, Phantom! I'm Josh Korcher and thanks for watching. After those surprises, I need something I can expect. Maybe something that's been around for a very long time. Something truly ancient. Hey, don't look at me. I can't keep spoon feeding these to you forever. Cut! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching. <laughs>